I'm going to be elaborating somewhat um, on the reckoning and dismissal of the shepherds who are the rabbis. And I'm going to get into that. The definition is themselves, what this means, and, and in part why God has done this. One thing I want to make emphatically clear, since I hadn't heard one word from a rabbi, and I'm quite certain as a group, maybe not all, as a group, they had no idea there'd be a reckoning and a dismissal by God. They would not enter the scroll of remembrance, which means they don't see God's heaven for the Jewish people, which is something you do not want to miss. Because they just talk about the Messianic era. All of a sudden, Moshiach perfects the world. Everybody loves the Jew and exalts him in the world. The world speaking Hebrew. And the sole existence of mankind becomes to know God. Nations love nations. Things that simply cannot happen. And what do they leave out? How about God might hurl your glory to the ground or utter destruction if you don't recognize Elijah? You know, you're praying for Moshiach every day. One, you don't know you're about to get dismissed when he comes. And two, you completely ignore utter destruction if Elijah is not recognized. He clears the way for the building of the temple, which is God's purpose that might prosper. Don't build it. Utter destruction will come someday. Build it. And you will never be defeated and dispersed again. Who should you be looking for? I mean, what does David do? He brings the reckoning and dismissal of the shepherds, the rabbis. That's what David does primarily. And with him comes uh, God's grant of a covenant of friendship, which differs markedly. It absolutely refutes a messianic error. God says things like, there'll be a planting of renown when I come with Moshe. You will no longer be the taunts of nations. That, that tells you one thing. The nations aren't exalting you. You're just not being taunted. Why? God's in his temple again. And they're not quite sure if it's true or not. For the most part, that would be the majority. Uh, and, of course, the covenant of friendship. Well, that is the covenant of friendship. No longer dispersed. You will not be defeated. Dispersed. The temple in your midst. The world will know God sanctifies Israel. That's what you get. You don't get perfection throughout the world. You don't get exalted throughout the world. If that's what God had intended, this is where he did written it. In the covenant of friendship. It absolutely refutes it. You got utter destruction. Malachi 3. You got your glory hur hurled to the ground. Your power. Um, if you don't assist God in recognizing me. That's what it says. He's saying, you know, uh, who is this coming from Adam, Gentile lands, Christianity? Who is this? You know, the peoples, no one listens to him, and he's not happy about it, and he says it, I think it's verse 3, could be four. He's stunned that he's not getting a response, particularly, and I know why now, the mountain of evidence that has been presented to the Jewish people on these videos cannot be surpassed by any other man to come. I'm either him or he ain't coming. Which is it? God said he was coming. God's righteous servant. What was David? A servant who was righteous. Who was Elijah? Servant who was righteous. Who was Moses? Servant who was righteous. Who else? Who are we missing? God's righteous servant. One description, four righteous servants. I am all four men. I... I just reposted it again. I have a verse-by-verse -verse commentary solely showing how I and my life fits Isaiah 53 and explaining it. Explaining what he was wounded for our sins means. No man has ever been able to do that before me. Certainly not Toby a singer with his absurdity. An absolute absurdity. Six million Jews die and they're a ram a ram guilt offering. That's not even all of Israel. That's about one-third of Israel at the time. Nobody got long life. 
it looks like Hitler's the one who made the sacrifice, and he didn't get long life. No one's made, no one was made righteous because of it. It's an absurdity. Okay, he couldn't come close to interpreting the true meaning and the way to um, to make this understandable. Isaiah 53 is in large part a snare. Okay, God knew the Gentiles, the Gentiles were going to take your book one way or another. And he set them up. He set them up for the day of the Lord. And he set up the rabbis too. He knew you were going to be practicing the Messianic era. All of these are proof as I straighten all this out, putting forth what he wants Judaism to be. This is what God wants Judaism to be. Not what Rambam wants it to be. He doesn't even want the entire world to be simply to know God. It's not what he wants. Primarily, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm creating a new heaven, he says that first, and a new earth. What's new about the heaven you're creating? What changes? I'm going to have a new host of angels, the angels of Israel. And I want every Jewish, all of my children to go through the same thing they've all had to go through. Anti-Semitism, racism, bigotry, uh, having to uh, survive on a planet that simply does not like them. That's what he's looking for. That's the angels of Israel. You've got your own unique personality. 613 laws. Okay, about 200 of them were animal sacrifice, and that was done away with by his prophet. God said, I don't want you animals anymore. Yet Toby, your senior, thinks he wants a human being. You're not supposed to add to or take away anything from the Torah. And when you see you're about to do it, you better ask yourself, where am I wrong? Where am I wrong to add a human being, much less six million of them, and, you know, that's going Christian. That's what they did. Let's put a human being in an unblemished land and we'll be sin free. I don't know what, I don't know what your guilt offering did for the, <laughs> for the Jewish people who become the righteous servant. No, the righteous servant is for the day of the Lord. He has to have a Moses, a representative. It could be an Elijah or a David. But he's got to have a man. Okay, I've said it to the T. That my Isaiah 53 has been out there for over two years, and I get nothing. Don't tell me these people like Toby and Jews for Judaism haven't heard some rumblings. I can't say exactly what. God doesn't tell me things like that. He'd never tell me what another person's thinking. He won't tell me anything to happen in the future. If I can't find out an answer of my own, then I don't find it. They don't give it to me. Yeah. But, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> one of my first lessons, and, and this is for the rabbis who think, God, this, this can't be, or he's not David. Uh, we're not working with him to dismiss. They just want to pretend it's not there. Yeah, you're not going to heaven. Okay? That's every rabbi on the face of the earth. I would include religious leaders. Matter of fact, if I had my way, and I don't, I'd include the government because they're leaders. But let's get to this first. Because y'all don't know God like I know God. I've been with him for 13 years in the fire of refinement, punishment, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing, bruising, wounding. And it is constant and incessant. I will say this, I couldn't see it for about five years. But it has changed me. I am, I am such a different man today than I was. When this thing started, I was no more capable of handling the tasks that are before me since it's clearing the way for the building of the third temple. Just talking in front of people. I was a lawyer, but I was a book lawyer. I didn't like talking in front of people. Matter of fact, I can't remember the time I ever had. I wasn't sociable. I just, uh, I was a loner. All that's different now with God in me. The Spirit of God, you know, I'm in my spirit and my spirit's in me. Guess what? God's in his spirit and his spirit's in him. It's the same thing. And his spirit is the angel of his presence. He made an angel, created an entity, a person, in existence, with emotions. And for his body, he did not give him human form and wings. No, 
His body is the Spirit of God. So if God comes to you, when the angel of the Lord comes to you, you are for that time a man of divine name. Now the man uh, who wrestled with Jacob, that's just, God just saw a fellow near Jacob, woke him up, told him, I'm the God of this land, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have something for you to do. And it's all to do with God. It's instant. You know who he is. There's no, huh? Who is this? You say, no, no. You, say, you say, okay, let's go. I'm ready. What are we doing? <laughs> He's a man of divine beings, but he was just one night. So he didn't go through much of a fire refinement, if any. I mean, he had to wrestle all night. But God does this with all his prophets. It's just the way of changing this. It's like, you know, he has to break our will. And he can't have me snapping at people. I was known as a fighter. And, you know, if you said something to me that I didn't like, I didn't respond verbally to you. I just I just hit you. I just laid into you. Fight something. Nobody talks to me like that. That's how I was. And that's, God said, this was taking so long. <laughs> because, uh, it's got, the last three years have been the worst out of 13. Going on 14 now. It's, you know, as he says, it just takes more to get the response out of you, the, the small change that I want out of you. I, and I'm telling you, I'm ready. I am flat out ready. And what is, is a problem with your people. They don't know who you are. When you say other destruction is coming, you're not fooling around. Here's, here's what, you know, you kind of get uh, one personality of God in the Hebrew Bible. You know, it, it's not far ranging. But what he showed me is based on the following. This is one of the first lessons he gave me. And anybody can, can look at this. I don't have my glasses on. I'll get through it the best I can. But this is the chapter that leads to the purchase of the Temple Mount. And it's uh, 2 Samuel, chapter 24, verse 1. The anger of the Lord arose. Okay, I got to get my glasses. Bear with me. The anger of the Lord again flared up against Israel, and he incited David against him, saying, Go and number Israel and Judah. That be the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, sometimes the kingdom of Ephraim, the largest uh, tribe landowner, immediately north of the lands of Benjamin, which is a partition between uh, Ephraim and Judah. And Benjamin is considered part of Judah because that's where the kings rule from. Go on down with them. Apparently there's some, part, <laughs> there's some problem in taking a census. I don't know what it is. But uh, he incited David to do it and then he put him into a three-pronged test. Do you want me to come against the people? Do you want me to come against you and one other one? And he said, let it be against the people. Let no man take me. And God did. And he kills uh, pestilence. And 70,000 had died almost immediately. Now, did God just go down and kill 70,000 uh, Israelites? No. He takes the credit for it. It just makes him look mean and tough. Listen to everything I say. The pestilence was already there. God could see it. He knew it was coming. And he does this a lot. He says, I will come with utter destruction. No, his creation is going to utterly destroy Israel. I would suggest, he won't tell me, I would suggest we'll talk to nuclear bombs from Iran right now. Someday. And they'll do it. They will do it if they get it. In any event, that's how... Oh, and it's interesting, the numbers are different. The census numbers are a little bit different from what I'm about to read in um, 1 Chronicles. 
and so is the amount of money paid for the people out out of David's pocket, is what he makes it sound like, but I'm sure it was the kingdom's money. I would think so. I, I don't know why he'd have a separate side job or anything. If you'll turn to 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, it's the same story. It even says it's the same story somewhere in here. Maybe there's a footnote. Uh, Satan arose against Israel and incited David to number Israel. And then you get the same story. You know, David David realizes what he did was wrong. See, he incited him. He didn't go tell him. He went to a prophet and told somebody and this and that. And then David was all uh, wanted to be in repentance and was sorry he had done it. And again, I don't know why it's bad. Um, they, they won't tell me. I've asked them right before we started this. <laughs> they just, eh, they'll know. So, um, what, 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 is, what do we have here? Satan inside of David and God inside of David in the book of the prophets and in the writings, in the writings, it's Satan. First of all, Satan doesn't exist. Judaism doesn't believe in hell, and they shouldn't. There is no hell. God's got, you know, if you don't heal or rear him, if you sin all the time, he just doesn't pay attention to you. He knows his creation. He knows what humanity does. He knows what humans are. He knows there's no stopping that. And, uh, I don't know, you might, you might say, Billy got a special place for Hitler? <laughs> and answer is, he tells me no. I just don't, I don't think about it. He doesn't mean anything to me. But why is that in here? You, you would want to say, well, if I had to go either way, I'd say uh, uh, one, 1 Samuel is who you go with because that's the book of the prophets. And I, I'd agree with that, except God wrote this whole book. He had a whole thing written. It's not just Torah. Don't forget that. It's not just the Torah dictated to Moses. If you, uh, the book of Ezekiel, just as soon as Ezekiel wrote it, might not be the case, might not be all of it, but, you know, just go with that. Whoever the main character is, they wrote it for God, because if they're talk if he's talking to you, and he's going to be with you quite a while, like in writing one of these big books of 70 chapters, you're going through the fire of refinement. Moses went through the fire of refinement. You know how you know? Because it breaks your will. It makes you humble. It, 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 it takes anger out of you that you used to not be able to control. We start with Moses. He killed a man. He was so angry. He's getting into fights. Then he runs away. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't account for himself. He doesn't ask peril for... for, for uh, he, he doesn't repent. He runs away. He doesn't take account for his own actions. Not a good person. At the end of his life, it is said in the Bible, Moses was the most humble man on earth. <laughs> God said, Keith, I put that in there primarily for you. So you would understand you're not the only one that's ever gone through this. He says, you're tops. I mean, you're four prophets in one. Uh, Moses would be number two as far as the severity. But it took a man with that kind of anger. And Ezekiel had that kind of anger. He said, he said, I want a, a spirit seized me, and I went in bitterness and the fury of my spirit in the hand of God. He's in the hand of God, but he's bitter and furious. I know the feeling. That's the fire of refinement. That is the key to understanding Isaiah 53 and those words. A man is wounded, chastised, brushed, crude, uh, bruised, now treated. So that I can go to those who are suffering guilt for sin and have the ability to make them understand God is here. Go to Judaism. Be observant. Stop sinning. Your guilt will go away. I offer myself to go through the fire of refinement so that I can remove your guilt. That's what it's all about. That's the first six verses. The witnesses. Wounded for our sins. Bruised for this. Crushed for this. 
Okay? It's, and, and it's just for me to be prepared. Now, he didn't even ask Ezekiel. He didn't have to ask me. You don't say no to him. He's God. You don't say no. You say, okay. <laughs> I've said, okay, a million times, I believe. But, so to, to explain this, God says, just imagine a scale with the most, the, the finest, goodest, <laughs> nicest, kind, merciful person you could ever meet. And down here, put Satan, the meanest, most vile, uh, brutal, doesn't care about your pain. And he can go all through it. Okay? He, he, he literally decides what emotions he's going to have. Now, I'm in the fire of fire, and I call this the black hat, this the white hat. This is what he told me. And we have a lot of good times in here. I mean, there's a lot of white hat, and the Holy Spirit's always in the white hat. Uh, he can be a troubler sometimes, but, you know, it's kind of set up by God, where he's sent to the sight thing. Uh, and, and then uh, the black hat. This is where he is with me most of the time. The fire of fire. But we get over here. We get over here. Uh, the point is, he's not just uh, listen to what I say or I'll put a pestilence on you. Uh, you don't stop sinning. I'm, I'm going to exile you. Uh, I'm going to take your temple. He, that would be someone over here. Not necessarily to Satan. But he said, that's why that was written that way. So I can tell you about it. But he's really, I mean, when he's flat out in the middle, he, he, I just love that personality. It just does me well. So um, he, he wants me to tell the Jewish people about him. And my, you know, my story, there's a lot I can't get into. I mean, he told me two things right off the bat. One, I don't care about Japan. And there's nothing I won't do to get you ready. There's no low I won't sink to. I will lie to you. And he, he, yeah, I know it says God doesn't lie. In the fire refinement, he does anything to incite me. That would come under chastisement. Uh, wounding, slamming me to the ground. He's broken my chin open two or three times. Cracked my skull. I got a nervous bed. Uh, black eyes, skin off my face. Uh, that's one thing. And, you, you know, you ask yourself, what is this really doing to change me? But it eventually does. I still don't understand it. I told him I never understand it. <coughs> but indeed, it's working. So, uh, for the rabbis, if you think by ignoring me with the amount of evidence God has put before you, I mean, he planned this entire book before he made creation. And selected his chosen. The entirety of it. That's why you only see angel of his presence and Holy Spirit one time. Judaism says Holy Spirit is not a person. <laughs> There's plenty of evidence in the scripture that he is. And I can tell you personally he is. And he's a great little person too. Well, let me carry on. It's nobody, he's not, I guarantee you. If Toby is senior and Jews for Judaism was sitting back there going, well, you know, we make money. Oh, that's what they wouldn't say, we make money on Isaiah 53. Or we can't say we're wrong because of your arrogance. And the, the ignorance that you show in your commentary just defies logic to me because God told me from the get go. You know, I was an atheist for 50 years, had nothing to do with religious people. He said they were very intelligent um, uh, people. Uh, Judaism is, is well based on the ground, all makes sense. This is what he told me in the beginning. <laughs> and since then, I learned a lot different. I don't think much about their capabilities at all. Remember, I'm a prophet. God taught me. God controls my mind, my thoughts, my words, my physical motions. Because I'm in the cords of his power. He can spin me like a top if he wants, slam me to the ground. He can make me he can make me shake like a leaf. 
so that when I try to eat, I can't hold my food on the utensil, and I end up having to use, take the bowl and put it, yeah, just embarrass you. Uh, you know, I think, you don't really humiliate me. It is maltreatment, but I can tell you I sure don't like you doing it. And he's got to he'll do it with my legs, where you feel you're going to fall down. Sometimes I dread walking down the steps when he's got me right in the midst of... Um, he, he calls it a three-day thing, where you, you know, which is at least once a week, if not twice. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about, and eventually that kind of treatment, mild treatment, changes you. And it also makes me, you know, I know what I've been through. I know the pain that I've been through. And I'm not even counting the accidents he put me through, being shot, giving me cancer, you know, shot to the abdomen. I'm, not, I'm just talking about since he came and started talking to me when I was 50. Um, well, let me go over this reckoning again, because apparently it's just not getting through. And if those particular rabbis aren't listening, I get plenty of views. I mean, I guess 4,000 now or something, which is nothing for the big boys. But, you know, I'm not a, a rabbi. Uh, certainly not a, anything to do with Christianity, Pastor. You know, I stayed away from religious people. I can't ever remember having a religious conversation uh, until uh, I was 50 with God. When he said, let's go buy you a Tanakh. And I said, what's a Tanakh? And uh, that's when he started teaching me. Thus said, apparently this, I don't know, I don't know their answer to this, I'd love to hear it. Why don't you know about this? Thus said the Lord God, I am going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them for my flock, and I will dismiss them from tending the flock. Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them to tend them. He shall be a shepherd to them. I, the Lord, will be their God, my servant David, shall be a ruler among them. Not a king ruling over them, among them. In the mission of Torah, Brambam's got two chapters on King David, and he's making every bit of it up. He's thinking, what would the divinity dynasty be like today? And off he goes. None of it's in the Bible. None of it. King Moshiach will study Torah all the day and all the night. No, he doesn't. Not even close. Because see, we, they, they got the Torah down. We, <laughs> we do, you know, I know nothing about it. It's not like I haven't read it, but it's not like the prophets. And to some extent, the writings. My servant David, he shall tend them. He shall be a shepherd to them. I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be a ruler among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. And I will grant them a covenant of friendship. Again, it is so far removed from the Messianic era. Uh, why, don't, why, why don't the rabbis recognize that? You won't be the taunts of nations. You won't be defeated and dispersed again. His sanctuary amongst you, the world will know. He sanctifies Israel, a planting of a man. That's it. That's what happens when Moshe comes. You tell him I said so. You, if, you, if it looks like I'm a little, I get a little hot about this, God controls my emotions too. And that's how he wants them to hear it. And never forget, he can speak straight through me. As a rule, he's always speaking through me since he controls my thoughts and my words. But it's always based on my personality. He can change that. He can change that. But if you're not a believer in a, a man divine being, it doesn't help. You just think I'm putting on an act. Um, I mean, I've had conversations with him where I'm looking into a mirror, okay? And when you're talking to people, you... You, 
you, you, know, uh, you know, you know what your demeanor is. You know, you know what you're sounding like and what you look like. And I'm looking at a mirror, and again, cause of his power only. I literally had a conversation with him, and I looked in the mirror, and that's not who I am in that moment, and it's not what I sound like. And he, you know, he, this is my lessons. I had lessons all day long, and I had for 13 years. I mean, he's doing something with me all the time. And, and primarily, again, this control of my mind is based on my capacity as Elijah to teach you how you can think in heaven. Your spirit reads your mind. Okay, your mind takes in, yeah, you know, your mind's just electrical impulses, little chemicals, different tissue. And it just, it takes in what eyes can take in and what ears can take in. Your person is the spirit in you. Spirit and soul. And um, together, spirit and soul form a person. Uh, the soul's kind of like the DNA of who you're going to be. In heaven, you don't have that mind. God becomes the information of your mind. And he can do it for everybody in heaven. That's why he said, you know, before you pray, I will answer. <laughs> Just because he's the one having you think, I'm going to pray. <laughs> and you won't remember the things of the past. That's a whole other discussion. But I have all of that information because I'm Elijah. There's a reason he took him up specifically and nobody else and sends him back. It's a further proof of who I am outside the fact I fit every verse of Isaiah 53, outside the fact I'm the only man who's ever been able to explain Isaiah 53, the fact that despite your greatest mind, Jews for Judaism, Toby is saying, and everybody else who makes commentary on it have never been able to figure it out. You can't figure it out if you're not the righteous servant. And I couldn't see, I read it the first time, I said, what is this? And I said, who do you think that is? I said, I had no idea. <laughs> he said, that's you. I said, okay. <laughs> this is in the first two years. I can't remember the exactly one. Okay, now these words are used. My servant David shall be king over them. Be one shepherd for them all. King, prince, shepherd means leader. That's what it means. I won't be getting to that. Just leader. This is words of leadership. It's not a divinity kingdom. God, God knew all things from the beginning. And he knew when he had the day of the Lord, Israel would be a democratic free country. There's no place for a kingdom. You know, you want a kingdom, go live in Saudi Arabia. They shall follow my rules and faithfully obey my laws. Thus they shall remain in the land which I gave to my servant Jacob and in which your fathers dwelt. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever with my servant David as their prince for all time. That would be the line of David. You know, through Solomon, Solomon had the same covenant with God. And, and this is this the first people to read this are in antiquity. They understood king and prince. And, and back then, I, I mean, I can't fault Rambam too much, uh, but today we, we know better because it's a democratic country. It's just that not Middle East, I guess, has got the most kings and kingdoms. Uh, anywhere in the world, but anyway, God knew. He knew Rome was going to destroy the second temple, the dispersal would, uh, would occur, the diaspora began, which is away from the promised land, and he knew they weren't going to just come back of their own, but that, and he didn't cause it, despite what Toby Singer says, but that the world would drive them back one day. He knew it was going to be ugly, but, you know, he said, well, why didn't you come help? <laughs> why didn't you come back? You're not supposed to be out there. you got to learn your lesson. There's some black cat there. You see that? Don't forget, he is a celestial being. He is not human. He has emotions, but he can actually operate his emotions, whereas we can't. Uh, we can't do an extent.
Okay, in today's world, with so many synagogues and people of Israel, the best interpretation of this dismissal is that uh, David and, uh, will be a leader of God's flock to tend them and be a ruler among them. Like a rabbi, a person with knowledge, a teacher, but I, I'm, I'm not getting ordained or anything. Okay, reckoning. This is what reckoning means. It's the avenging or punishing of past mistakes or misdeeds. Teaching messianic here. I mean, you're just not putting your thinking hat on. That, that was for antiquity, Middle Ages. But, the, you know, uh, resurrection of the dead, the 13th fundamental principle of Judaism by Rambam. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. Do you really? Do you really? Are you telling the truth in that prayer? We've gone through the age of medicine, science, knowledge. We know you cannot resurrect a human being from dust. They have to be conceived and born, period. And there's never been a virgin. God, a great thing. You should hear God's, how he... Uh, Tears that apart. That woman with child's <laughs> Isaiah's concubine, he's married to the prophet Tess, and this child, Emmanuel, doesn't learn right from wrong until he's nine years old. My question is, why isn't he Jesus? If his mother is a virgin, why isn't he Jesus? And I'm going to put it to you. I got, I'm going to be the greatest anti missionary of all time, particularly though, because eventually, the many and the multitude are going to be telling the world who can believe our report. That's him. Who is the arm of the Lord been real done? That's him. He knows too much. It's impossible to deny what's happening here. It's impossible to deny that there are rabbis who have heard me and are ignoring it. What about Elijah, rabbis who ignore? Because I'm Elijah too. What about that? You want to bring? You want to be responsible for utter destruction? How many? How many? How many millions you lose in the Holocaust? Six million? How many Israeli Jews do you have right now? Well, it's seven million. You ready to up the ante on that? How many Jews can we kill at one time? You're not going to recognize David. You don't get. You don't get the covenant of friendship. And it doesn't go into. I have both covenants. Sin forgiveness in Jeremiah 31 that puts sore on your heart and uh, friendship. And God wrote, when he was dictating to me uh, the book, Isaiah 53, the day of the Lord, he actually ha has it stated that when these books are published, the covenants go into effect. Well, as you can imagine, I can't get them published. And it has to be a big time publisher who can distribute worldwide and market worldwide because all Jews have to read it and know they're sin free in the Holy See. It's part of also being Elijah come back to Judaism and the righteous servant, 53 makes so many righteous well in effect I've already done that with the covenants when the books are published. If there's any rabbi who'd like to step out of dismissal and see the heaven God is creating contact me I'm easy to talk to. I was a lawyer for over 20 years. Had clients, you know, come in, had to be friendly. Yeah, I said I was antisocial, but in a business context, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. I, I knew my parameters, so to speak. Uh, go forward and help me. Uh, you're a servant of God. If you're a Jew out there, you're a servant of God. Be proactive. Anything you can do to get me recognized, anything you can do, and, and understand this. This is supposed to happen according to Jeremiah. The land lay desolate for 2,000 years. Now the cities have been renewed, restored, Jerusalem rebuilt, the land blooms again. That's what it says. And it says, then I'll, I'll bring a new covenant to you. Huh, new covenant. You know what Rashi says? New covenant commentary. The angel, it's the angel of the covenant you desire. There's only two. 
and daily brings uh, friendship. So we're talking about uh, the, the covenant of Assyria forgiveness to make you a holy city, just like God did with the Assyrian Babylon exiles that had the second temple built. This is to have the third one built. You got a clean slate, but if you start sinning, that covenant didn't do you any good at all. So, you know, my job is come back. Don't let the evil inclination get you, so to speak. You got a clean slate. Honor God by coming back to observant Judaism. See, I got all kinds of pulls um, to help refill the synagogues to grow every year instead of decline every year. And part of it is you've got to change things like a resurrection of the dead. A time when the Jews are exalted. You know what you do? You make them lazy. What happened to never again? Never forget. you got other destruction on the horizon. I have no idea when God might just say, that's it. I've given them enough, they won't respond. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. And other destruction will come to them. You never know. You're servants. His servants. You're not the righteous servant as Toby is singer and Jews for Judaism, Michael Stoback, and whoever actually did the commentary, that absurdity they both put out there. Hey, Michael Stoback bases his whole commentary on an exaltation of the world of the Jew, the Messianic era. His whole commentary is based on something that will never happen. Never. You know, these are religious people. I don't know how they do it. No, I believe in it. I believe in resurrection. Oh, you believe in millions and millions and millions of people suddenly appearing in Israel? Who, who's going to feed them? Who's going to put food on the table for them? Hey, guess what? You, you're going to have slave Israelites from Egypt. You know what God says, if you see a slave Israelite from Egypt, you know what you're supposed to do? Run. Run and get a gun quick. They'll kill you. These people were savage. They still weren't cooking their food back then. Slaves. No schools. Nobody around them school. No, nobody listened to you. Believing in all kinds of gods and this and that from Egypt. Yeah, they're suddenly going to appear. That's what they say. Every single Jew who's ever lived. You got six million from the Holocaust. What are you going to do with that six million? That's just, that's just four years. It's the most... You're going to lose the young people. You know, they're always looking for fake news. I guarantee you, if I, if I sat down there in the synagogue when I was a young man, and I didn't, of course, I'd have gotten up and walked out right in the middle of it. You're saying, what? You think every Jew who's ever lived is not a, a cut, rise old bones rise. And, and their soul is going to come from some keeper of the soul's place and come into that body. That's your belief? Well, I got to go. I got to go. I heard y'all real practical down to earth. You know, you had things to do. You had Shabbat. You had high holidays. Uh, you know. Uh, Mrs. Uh, but I'm not listening to garbage, okay? I'm a man of reasoning and intelligence. The people in antiquity and middle age weren't. And that, the, all those things that you come up with, uh, swords into plowshares, you know, that was for a time gone by. That, man will always be at war, period. And most of you, no man can get all of Israel. Just to follow Thor? Good luck. Only about 30% of them are even observant. You know, it's secular. God wants that straightened out. He wants a practical religion for the chosen. And he wants the world to hear about it. And it helps me take the wrath of God to Christianity. Lift me up. I'm the man of Isaiah 53. And, and where does that come from? Chapter 51. I'm going, I'm going to take my bowl of wrath, my, my cup of reading, and I'm going to take it from you, my people, and I'm going to pass it to those who told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you, and walked all over your back, something like that. Okay, what happens next? 52 comes up. That's where, that's where 
the righteous servant of Isaiah 53, that's where the description starts. 13 to 15, and then all of 53. Do you see the connection there? Wrath's coming. Now, how does that match up with Moshe coming? In a Messianic era, curse. And there's a resurrection of the dead, which is a proof of who I am. Where's God's vengeance? Where's the doom upon the nation in Psalms 149, when Psalm 149 ending in 150 with an exaltation of the Lord, which you can think of as, we're building the temple again. And by the way, it doesn't have to be on the Temple Mount. It's got to be on Mount Zion. Uh, two things. One, it's not big enough for what God wants. He'll give me the plans when necessary. It's kind of like you know, getting the plans for um, the ten of meetings or you know, anything. He'll give it to me. I'll give it to the right people. But they've got to recognize who I am. Yeah, you believe in the Messianic era, but, but, but you rabbis, you rabbis, God's got to force your hand. That's what this is about. He's forcing your hand. And he's putting the destruction of Israel on your shoulders. And I'm not going to stop talking about it. And how you ignore me. You can't find greater. Just because it's not your faith. He says there's not a resurrection of the dead. I can't listen to him. I've never heard of the reckoning and dismissal. They're arrogant and they're ignorant. To me. Now, regular society, they're real intelligent people. They can fool the flock who are just aimless sheep. They can't fool me because God's in me. He won't let it happen. And so I can incite them. You tell either one of them, if they want to debate, tell Cody your singer who says he'll debate anybody on 53. You tell him I'm ready. You tell him I'm ready. And he better take some serious before we get there because I will incite him. I will arouse him with my words. And you wait till I start getting hold of the Christians. If you've been reading the details and watching my videos, you see I've got some powerful things to tell them. And I will not hold back. Remember, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the most humble man in the world yet. This is the kind of person Moses and Ezekiel was. Reckoning, the avenging or punishing of past mistakes or misdeeds. It's not just the Messianic era. How about these two, Tobia and Scobag Jews for Judaism? I can't imagine they really believe what they're saying. They probably had to work and work. How can I explain this part? How can, you know, Tobia, <laughs> Tobia's fingers, it just scares me because in the beginning, I really thought so highly of it. Years and years ago when God started teaching me, I mean, listening to the radio show, and uh, I was learning things from him. He's got a lot of knowledge, but his capability of reasoning is at the level of antiquity, where there was no reason. Everybody lived on emotion because you, you learn how to reason in school. Maybe he just went to a yeshiva and, and didn't have to, to figure out math and other things that, that, that teach you. You don't use it, but it teaches you to reason. Okay, I got to get off this thing. Why is shepherds a metaphor for rabbis? In case they think there's a little wormhole there to get by there. Well, shepherds doesn't necessarily mean rabbis. Yes, it does. The term rabbi in the original Hebrew means a teacher. In pursuing that calling, individuals have responded to the various needs of their Jewish community. In addition to the literal meaning of the word rabbi, Jewish tradition views the three Hebrew letters of that word to represent an acronym. The abbreviation translates to shepherd of the children of Israel. The shepherd is the dominant leadership, remember leadership, king, prince, shepherd, is the dominant leadership metaphor in the Hebrew Bible. The role of the shepherd was a cornerstone of the Hebrew economy 
as sheep provided key staples of wool, meat, and other commodities. God's choice of the shepherd as a leadership metaphor made sense for a nomadic society depending on sheep, goats, and cattle. Okay, the question, why all of the rabbis, even those without flocks, those who don't say anything about a messianic era, still part of the religion they call their own. God is not pleased with the teaching of the rabbis of the day of the Lord, which is none, and their reliance on the opinions and commentaries of the sages and rabbis from the ancient age and middle ages. There are many inconsistencies and errors in what the sages and rabbis say and what the scripture says, and of course, they had not gone through the age of science, medicine, knowledge, uh, communication with the internet. There's a whole different group of people. You got to know how to read the Bible. Toby, Jews for Judaism. It's written first for antiquity in the Middle Ages. There's things in there just for them. There's plenty for the day of the Lord. And never again, never forget what the world will do to you if you don't heed God's prophet. And what they'll do to you, point, <laughs> even if there's no prophet, and particularly if there's a prophet, because God, God is performing this video, God himself. And I'm sure that's a strange concept to them. They don't know. And that's why they're so arrogant. And just remember what God says he's going to do to the Christians. I will pull you down from your cliff dwellings for your arrogance. Yeah, he doesn't care for arrogance. He doesn't care for it a bit. He doesn't care for people who ignore his prophet. Remember, when I say he don't care, he says, oh, God cares about everybody, loves everybody. And you haven't lived with him and gone through a fire or fire. I feel like he absolutely hates me a good deal of the time. Because I feel I'm ready. I don't want to. I, how much more can you change me? <laughs> and he's like, are you the most humble man on earth? Yeah, so he can be funny. I shouldn't laugh and, and give him, you know, the okay on that. It was kind of funny. That may have been the Holy Spirit. God says the anointed one is a shepherd, king, and prince of the flock. Not of the promised land and all his people and perfecting the world. Rambam removes God's word and places it replaces it with Rambam's word. <laughs> the anointed one is the king of the lands and people and will have a kingdom basically ruling the world. That's what it sounds like. God says the prophets were rarely listened to by religious leaders in biblical times. Before he stopped speaking to the prophets, he said, "This is the You know, I know what I know, and that's my faith. And uh, I don't care what you say or anything. Understand what you're saying? You know, I think I think the Christians got a lot on that. Don't stand on the corner. I don't know. Anyway, arrogance. And can't you you can't admit you're wrong. Can't admit you're wrong, and can't accept the evidence God has given you as being insufficient. Or you're not even taking the time to look at it, you're hiding. You got your head in the sand. That's no better. You do not heed and revere the Lord. You can say you do all you want. But his prophet is speaking and when that happens, God is speaking. And uh, I don't see anybody listening to me. That's what this video is about. Trying to, trying to let y'all know how serious this is. You want to see seven million dead Jews? You want to see Israel disappear? Keep ignoring Elijah. And that's what you get according to God. I don't know. Y'all just select what God's words you want to abide by. And then, and, and Rambam's words sound so much better. Whole world just to know God. Food for everybody. Delicacies like dust in the wind. Well, who's going to do the farming? <laughs> Where, who's producing this? Is, is it my? <laughs> the stuff they got in the desert and the exit, Mazda, Mazda, come on. 
Ik ging niet in het maar we dacht in het huis. Dit is niet meer. Ik heb het altijd van God over. Interpreting en teaching what God actually says will not bring in many donations for the reason that the flock will want to know why God is going to have a reckoning with them and dismiss them. They will want to know what the sages and rabbis have done to anger God. The rabbis must learn how to read God's book. <laughs> the Hebrew Bible. The two books he dictated to me explain what all that means. They must be They must be read and taught to remove the dismissal. And, and if you're not a leader, if you're just an observant Jew, you go to synagogue and high holidays and everything, tell everybody you know, you're a servant of God. And his words come from me. This is when it's supposed to happen, unlike Jesus, who prophesied five times when he was coming back and every one of them Every one of them was false and fake. He didn't come back. He's gone. He's a myth anyway. He doesn't exist. You know, and if you see a Christian and they want to ask you what you think about Jesus, tell them. He's a myth. Don't, don't tell them, oh, yeah, well, he's a fine, I hear this all the time, he's a fine Jewish, uh, learned man, uh, we, but we, I don't believe that he died for my sins. No, don't do that. He's a myth. He's not real. God has an excellent argument on that. That is put together in the book and it's also on videos. It has to do with the scenes of the uh, this is Schultz. Okay, well my, my camera's gotta be getting it goes off every half hour. I'm gonna just keep reading as fast as I can. I don't think I'm gonna be able but I'm I'm not I, that'll be the end of, of this uh video which should be about an hour long. God has never changed the will of men or how they think of him and the Jewish people in his power. Any exaltation the Jewish people receive from the world will come through the efforts of God's righteous servant. That's me. But with him in control of everything I'm doing. As directed and commanded by God as he did with Moses. Moses was a man of divine beings. I am God's servant David, the only shepherd of the flock God recognizes, and my unwritten purpose, we know what the written ones are. We'll see what Elijah's clearing the way, recounseling families back uh, with Judaism, God's righteous servant, making the name righteous. Uh, you mentioned the prophet like Moses, you're talking about somebody who will write his words and speak his words. Um, uh, nobody's in bondage today, and that's the other thing he did. Elijah, ask him about heaven. And my unwritten purpose is to teach the matters of the two books he dictated to me, to tell my stories of living with God and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, what it is like to become a man in divine beings, a host of the Lord's host. It would be unwritten purposes, and I'm sure he's got plenty of others. The rabbi said, yet to heed me, I hadn't heard a peep out of him. Here's a man declaring he's Elijah. Utter destruction comes if they don't recognize me, and they don't want to speak to me. They don't want to get them books and read them. I know, I know totally you had for the most part, because nobody from Israel has read them. I'd be too embarrassed, and in, 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 in his arrogance, and his popularity and stardom, he's not even checking it out. Total disregard for utter destruction and the death of today, 7 million Israeli Jews. Utter destruction. It doesn't leave running for, yeah, some might get out. Good luck making it over to Europe. <laughs> yeah, they're going to make you, they're going to have you surrounded at the same time. It's about time they read uh, God's books. It's scripture. It's not canonized. It may be one day. But it's scripture. It's divinely received. Verbally given to me. Keep going to your computer. Write this down. There's a whole lot of learning that went in between that.